Okay, uh, we're studying Amos, the prophet Amos, as you, uh, as you gathered from, from last week. He is a shepherd from Tekoa, a small town in, in uh, Judah, the southern kingdom. He's a shepherd. He also tends sycamore fig trees uh, somewhere d- during the year at some point other than Tekoa. But he prophesied to the northern kingdom of Israel in the middle of the 8th century B.C. A good guess would be 762, right around there. That fits a lot of things. 762 B.C. is this shepherd who's prophesying to the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, After the split, the 931, we went through that. So you have Israel to the north, Judah to the south. Now Israel had grown economically and militarily uh, powerful. They had expanded during that first part of the 8th century. But while that, while that had happened, moral decay was eating at the insides of the nation. And that happens, uh, I think, more than we realize. That as they prospered and as the good times rolled, they were less reliant and had a tendency not to look to God and to chart their own course. And they became increasingly indifferent to their covenant responsibilities, to what God would have them do. They, uh, they started to care less and less about that. And though they clung to their rituals, as we'll see, they, they held to these rituals or these forms of religion. They engaged in idol worship and they ignored their duties to their fellow man. Things that God is very concerned about and how we treat one another, they didn't seem to care about that. But they were interested in doing these certain rituals. Now Amos in the time of his prophecy are identified in chapter 1 verse 1. And the withering effect of God's roar. That's mentioned in chapter 1 verse 2. That's a sign of impending judgment on the northern kingdom of Israel. When God is roaring like that. And Carmel is withering. You know this is a sign that uh, God is going to come against the nation. It's a sign of of the coming judgment. Then in Amos chapter 1, verses 3 through chapter 2, verse 5, these are oracles of judgment against the nations surrounding Israel. And we looked at that, uh, most of those last week. You see the prophet, he pronounces doom or judgment against Aram, Syria, Philistia, Phoenicia, Edom, Ammon, Moab. And when we left off, he sees like the lion is circling. And he, in chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, he pronounces judgment on, on the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom. And that's where I want to pick back up, looking at uh, what he has to say about Judah. And he says in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, he tells us that Judah is going to be punished for rejecting the law of the Lord and not keeping his statutes. So you just have this short oracle against Judah. Rejecting the law of the Lord, not keeping his statutes, is going to be punished And that happens in 733 B.C. It begins. You have Ken Fox's favorite Assyrian king, Tiglath-Pileser III. Uh, He comes and he subjugates Judah. And you can see that in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 16 to 21. He subjugates Judah about 30 years after this prophecy. And then in 701 B.C., we have another Assyrian ruler uh, named Sennacherib. And Sennacherib in 701 B.C., he quelled a rebellion in Judah by destroying 46 of the fortified cities in Judah and deporting the residents of those cities. And we have uh, here, in fact, is a relief that has been discovered from Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh. And this depicts his capture of one of the Judean cities, the city of Lachish. And you can see here with people shooting arrows up, you see these people falling head down falling off the wall, these people from the wall shooting. This is his relief of his assault. Sennacherib himself, this is his relief of his, his assault on the, on the city of Lachish. And then here is what's called the Taylor Prism, which is a six-sided cylinder, and that includes Sennacherib's own account of his raid into Judah. And the, the key text is, is here where Sennacherib says... I then besieged Hezekiah of Judah, who had not submitted to my yoke, and I captured 46 of his strong cities and fortresses, and innumerable small cities which were around about them, with the battering rams and the assault of engines, and the attack of foot soldiers, and by mines and breaches. 
himself like a caged bird. I shut up within Jerusalem his royal city. I threw up mounds against him, and I took vengeance upon any man who came forth from the city. Now, given the usual bragging that's done in these kinds of records, you know, these kings are not, uh, not exactly humble folks. So they, they like to really promote, well, they're like politicians. Yeah, that's, that's what they're like. And so they like to promote themselves, and so, you know, there's all kinds of bragging that's done. Uh, you can be sure, given that fact, that they, the bragging that's done in these royal records, you can be sure that if Sennacherib had actually captured the city of Jerusalem, he would have bragged about it. You see, he would have said something about that. And you can be equally sure that if he had suffered a humiliating defeat at Jerusalem, that he'd turn that sow's ear into a silk purse, meaning he'd lie about it, or he'd ignore it. One way or the, one way or the other. Now, regarding it, this, this assault, this is, of course, what we see in 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 35 and 36. This is where... God spares the city of Jerusalem by uh, destroying or killing 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And you see, well, it's no wonder he doesn't talk about capturing Jerusalem because he didn't capture Jerusalem because God protected Jerusalem. Now, regarding that text and that event in 2 Kings 19, the Old Testament scholar Paul House, he says, no other ancient texts record the Lord's killing of 185,000 Assyrian soldiers which is not surprising in view of their consistently positive viewpoint. That's what I'm telling you. They don't talk about things like that. If I get my head handed to me, that just goes away, and everybody knows that goes away. But he goes on, and he says, Normally only victories were recorded. Assyrian texts do refer to Sennacherib's return to Nineveh, and Herodotus, that's a 5th century B.C. Greek historian, Herodotus shows that there was, there was in Egypt the memory of an Assyrian retreat following a divine intervention. So you at least have in Egypt, there is some acknowledgement or, or recollection of an Assyrian retreat following a divine intervention. Now the way it comes out there is, is that the episode happened at the border of Egypt and Palestine, and the delivering God was an Egyptian God. But we know from 2 Kings, 2 Kings 19 what happened and what that represents then. That's a co-opting of that event for Egyptian purposes, or it's some kind of garbled recollection, but at least you have some indication of an event like that. So we first have, with regard to Judah, we have it being subjugated in 733. We have Sennacherib coming in 701 and, and destroying 46 of the fortified cities. And then, of course, a century later, we have Nebuchadnezzar. Now the Babylonians are in charge. And here comes Nebuchadnezzar. He comes in, in 605. He comes in 597. And he comes back in 587 or 586, some debate about the exact year. But he comes back in three uh, waves. 605 is when he took Daniel. 597, I think, is when he took Ezekiel. And then in 587, 586, he, of course, destroys the city of Jerusalem. And that's what Lamentations is about. And that was, of course, a tremendous event in the history of Israel. Now, in 1935 and in 1938... 21 ostraca, they're called, which are broken pieces of pottery. Okay, there were 21 ostraca on which letters had been written. They were discovered in the ruins of the city of Lachish. And on these, they were written during the time of Jeremiah, chapter 34, verse 7, when Nebuchadnezzar was advancing on Jerusalem. And so we have these writings from there. And here's a sample of two of the Lachish ostraca. Jeremiah 34, verse 7, it, it mentions, it says that Lachish and Azekah are the only fortified cities in, in Judea still holding out against Nebuchadnezzar's assault. Azekah was, was west of Jerusalem. Uh, Lachish, Azekah's west, and then Lachish is south of Azekah. And these letters are from a, a, a guy named, a, a commander named Hoshia. And he was stationed north of Lachish, and it seems that his function was to watch for signals from Azekah and from Lachish during Nebuchadnezzar's assault. So he's somehow an informant telling them this is what's going on. And on one of, the, one of these uh, uh, pieces of pottery, it's written, uh, Lachish Ostrakhan 4, it says, And let my Lord know that we are watching for the signals of Lachish according to all the indications which my Lord hath given 
for we cannot see Ezekiel. And so it seems this is, you know, as Nebuchadnezzar's coming, it looks like Ezekiel's been taken out of play, and he can still see the signals coming from Lachish, whatever import that was. So here we have, this is this oracle against the nations surrounding Israel. But the whole prophecy, the focus of the prophecy is the nation of Israel. And I can see the people in Israel as Amos is delivering these things saying, that's right, yeah. As you go, to, as you go around these, these nations, Ammon, Edom, Moab, the Philistines, the Phoenicians, that, yeah, yeah, boy, they, they deserve God's judgment. But they don't understand that what's happening is God is just coming and then he's going to park on Israel. And so you get that, the oracles of judgment against Israel are chapter 2, verse 6, through chapter 6, verse 14. There are a number, a number of oracles of doom delivered against the nation of Israel. And the first one is in, is in Amos chapter 2, verses 6 to 16. Now, I was going to just read the whole thing, but I want to kind of do it piecemeal. I'll see how that works. Uh, in chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, he says... Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted. A man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned, they lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Now, God is here. He is uh, giving the basis or, or giving the, uh, the grounds of his judgment against Israel. And their sins are that they had abused and exploited the underprivileged. They had abused and exploited the underprivileged. To sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, is, that probably refers to a corrupt legal system that allowed creditors unjustly, unjustly to make, to make debtors, poor debtors, their bond servants for a relatively trivial bribe. That's this thing about a pair of sandals. So it looks like what you have is you know, you, you have somebody who comes and says, listen, I'll be a bond servant in exchange for paying off this debt. You lend me this money, I'll be your bond servant. Or if I don't pay it back at a certain time, I'll be your bond servant. You have something like that, and then this corrupt legal machinery comes in. I say, well, he didn't pay it back. He didn't pay it back here. And I'm greasing the, my buddy. I'm paying my buddy a relatively trivial amount. I think the pair of sandals is probably hyperbole for a small amount. That here I'm bribing these people to hose these poor people. And I'm, I'm doing this and I, I'm winding up taking advantage of them. And, and putting them, basically selling them into bond servitude unjustly through a corrupt legal system where I'm bribing people. Whatever the specifics, it clearly was, this is clearly involves an abuse of the rights of the poor. Because verse 7 says they trample the heads of the poor. You see, whatever he's talking about, he's clearly talking about some kind of abuse of the rights of the poor because he says they trample the, heads of, they trample the heads of the poor and push the afflicted out of the way. That's how the NRSV or the NIV says, and deny justice to the oppressed. Amos chapter 5 verse 12 mentions the righteous poor being deprived of justice by means of bribes. And so here you have the wealthy and powerful. I mean, can you imagine that? Can you imagine the wealthy and powerful using their position to gain an advantage and to squeeze the underprivileged and the poor? Can anybody fathom that? Uh, yeah. And that's what they were doing. And it's like people complain, hey, we're getting, you know, we're getting shafted. We're getting... Too bad. We control the machinery. We are the elite. And you're just, that's too bad for you. But it's not too bad. See, in God's eyes, he sees us and says, this is horrible. That you would allow somebody and make a king out of somebody just because he's got money. What matters is the justice of the cause. That's what matters. Okay? Rich, poor, doesn't matter. The justice of the cause. And when you go ahead and you, you are allowing these bribes to subvert justice against poor people, it's a shameful thing. 
And he speaks of the, the statement that the father and the son use or go into the same, the same girl, therefore showing, showing disrespect for God's moral purity. That's what it means when it says, and profane my holy name. Showing disrespect for God's moral purity. This likely refers to sexual abuse of a female bond servant. You see, somebody who has obligated herself to work for the family either as payment of a debt or to survive economic destitution. And these men exploited her position and her lack of power not only simply by abusing her sexually, but by treating her as community property. A father and his son go into her. And I think it's tied to her lack of position and power because it comes between these two things that clearly are. So I don't think it's simply an isolated case of sexual immorality. I think it's tied to her being in a position that she can just be steamrolled in such a horrible way. Be abused that way. Be abused in spades. Not simply sexually abused, but you did dishonor her by treating her like absolute garbage. Why? Because she's just a bond servant and I'm a, I'm a big guy. And I can treat this fellow human being like trash. Because they don't have my money or my status or my position. I can treat them that way. And what is God doing while they're doing that? God is saying, oh, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that kind of thing. It says they deprive the poor of their garments given in pledge. Contrary to Exodus 22, 26, and 27. You know, you take this garment, you need to return it. Why? Because that's all the poor man has. So they deprive them of that garment. They used uh, corrupt legal machinery to impose fines to support their luxury. You see, and they enjoyed the fruit of this oppression in the very places where they purported to worship God. You see, he says here, they lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who've been fined. So here they are living the high life at the expense of poor people, and they got the chutzpah to be doing it in the very place where they purport to worship God. Now, that's a, that, that's a heart that's far from God. That's a heart that's kind of lost its sense of God is real, and he really cares about how I live and how I treat people that way. And then in, in chapter 2, verses 9 to 12, he says, Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars and who was as strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up some of your sons for prophets and some of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not indeed so, O people of Israel? Isn't that the truth? Who can deny I did that? Is that not so, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. This is what they did. You see, their rejection of the God who blessed them. They rejected him. Amorites, an Old Testament term, sometimes used for the pre-conquest population of Canaan. You can see, for example, in Genesis 15, 16, and God reminds them, you see, he reminds them that, listen, the, the one you are treating this way, I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. I am the one who gave you the promised land, defeated these, against these tremendous odds. I gave you the promised land, defeating the apparently invincible, invincible Amorite. You go, oh, we can't do this, we can't. I brought you out. I gave you the land. I'm the one who did that. And he cared for Israel's spiritual welfare by providing spiritual leaders in the form of prophets and Nazarites. I planted you here. I gave you spiritual leaders. Nazarites made a special vow of separation to God which involved abstaining from any product of the vine, abstaining from all fermented drinks, never cutting their hair, and never touching a dead body. And you can see that in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 to 12. Their devotion to God, see, their consecration, he gave them Nazarites, you see, 
their devotion to God and their consecration, that was a positive spiritual influence on the people. God said, I was looking out for you spiritually by giving you such people in your midst so that you could see their devotion and their consecration. I was trying to bless you. I not only planted you there, I was trying to bless you spiritually. And prophets, of course, were a spiritual blessing because they provided inspired spiritual guidance to the people. I put among you people through whom I would speak. I did that for you, didn't I? Didn't I do that for you? But Israel, what's Israel's response? Israel rejected God as shown by their rejection of the Nazarites and the prophets. He says, I gave you these people as a spiritual blessing, and what did you do? You forced the Nazarites to drink wine, and you told the prophets to shut up. That's how much you appreciated what I've done for you. Here I've blessed you, created you, delivered you, given you spiritual blessing in the form of the Nazarites and the prophets, and what do you say? Drop dead. Nazarites, we want you to, to break your vow and to begin to cease to be specially consecrated to God, to cease to be this influence. Prophets, we want you to shut up because we don't really care what you have to say because it turns out a lot of times what you deliver from God, we don't like. We don't like it. We don't want to hear what God has to say, so you shut up. So God says, you have rejected me in this. And then in 13 to 16, he gives them the punishment and he says, Behold, I will press you down in your place as a cart full of sheaves presses down. Flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not retain his strength, nor shall the mighty save his life. He who handles the bow shall not stand, and he who is swift on foot shall not save himself, nor shall he who rides the horse save his life. And he who is stout of heart among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, declares the Lord. He says, because you have treated me like I am trash. Like I, you wouldn't treat your father that way. And you've treated me this way. And he says, you're going to be judged. And I'm going to bring an assault on you. And the, the effect is, is you're not, going to spare, you're not going to save yourself. You're not going to be able to, to uh, be spared. And the nation, your nation will be militarily defeated. And that, of course, came to pass, culminating in the capture of Samaria in 722, 721 B.C. Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. He's prophesying to the Israelites. He's telling them you're going to be militarily defeated because of the way that you treat me and how you reject me, how you despise the blessings I've given you in your life. And he tells them that, and that comes to pass. In 722, 721, you can see that in 2 Kings 17, 3 to 6, 2 Kings 18, 9 and 10. The siege of Samaria, this was apparently begun by the Assyrian king Shalmaneser IV, and it was completed by Sargon, who succeeded Shalmaneser as an Assyrian king. It was, it was uh, completed by Sargon, who succeeds him during the latter part of 722 or the first part of 721. So right during the fall of Samaria, there's this transition. And Sargon is one of the generals. So who actually captured? Sargon certainly takes credit for it as he succeeds Shalmaneser. And he was involved in it. But here, by the way, is, here's a, I showed you this, I think, last week. This is a relief of Sargon from his palace at Korsabad. He's on the right there. So here we have this, this uh, Assyrian king who was instrumental in uh, affecting this judgment that God had pronounced through the prophet Amos, where he comes and captures and destroys or exports the people, deports them from the city of, of Samaria. And he, he, Sargon boasts, uh, he has a, at, at his palace in Korsabad, we've uncovered his inscriptions, and he boasts in one of those inscriptions, he says, at the beginning of my royal rule, I besieged and captured Samaria and led away as booty 27,290 inhabitants of it. I installed over them an officer of mine and imposed upon them the tribute of the former king. So here we have, we have Amos prophesies this. We have this comes to pass in 722-21. We not only have the Bible telling us about it, we have extra biblical uh, information on exactly what had happened. Now when I think about well, what, what is God saying to us today through this? I think you get a hint of some of what I think about it and what I've said. 
But, you know, one of the things is, is that we have to be concerned about the poor and needy. You see, it is easy when you're not to not care about the poor and needy. But we have to be concerned about them. Jeremiah 22, 15 and 16, God says about King Josiah, he says, he defended the cause of the poor and needy, and so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord? Do you see how central, how important it is as you have fellow human beings who suffer in these kinds of things to just not care? I mean, it is important that we care about them. It's easy not to. Just say, too bad. What do I care about you? I'm not poor and needy. You know, what do I care about you? But you see, God's heart is if you abuse them, if you exploit them, if you mistreat them, you're doing it to me, in essence, because my heart is for them. You see, they are people. They're not a subclass of people. They're people. And for you to just treat them that way for something as silly as economics uh, is something shameful, and you see that, and I think that we have, to, we have to keep that in mind. We must never treat the poor and powerless, the weak and vulnerable in our society as though they are less worthy or less important than we are. Here's what James said. You're familiar with what James said. My brothers, keep the faith of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ without partiality. For if a man wearing gold rings and fine clothes comes into your meeting and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in and you look at the one wearing the fine clothes, you say, oh, you sit here and stop. You sit here. You say that. To, and to the poor man, you say, hey, you go stand over there. You stand over there or sit under my footstool. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? He says, listen, my beloved brothers, did not God choose the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you dishonored the poor man. Why did I do it? You treated him like dirt. He's a person. He wants dignity. He wants respect. And you come in and treat him like, well, you don't, you don't have as much money as this guy. So you are dirt. You just slide over there. Maybe you can listen with your ear on the door out there. But this dude wearing the rich stuff. I want him here because maybe he'll contribute a lot. You see, maybe, maybe he, you know, maybe if, if we get this guy in, he can, he'll contribute some money. You see? So he says, look, he tells him, you know, but you dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich exploit you, and do they not drag you into courts? And I, when we went through James, I explained the context is what he's talking about. Do they not blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? If you truly fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbors yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality in the context of if you disrespect this poor man, if you favor the rich man and treat the poor man like dirt, he says you commit sin being convicted by the law as transgressors. You see, this is, this is not some minor deal. And so when I think about what Amos is saying, what God is saying to us through what he said there, you see a similar kind of thing was happening in the church in Corinth. We often miss this. But a similar thing was happening to the church in Corinth with regard to the fellowship meal or the love feast that was oftentimes accompanied by the, uh, it oftentimes accompanied the Lord's Supper in the early church. This idea of the love feast. See, when the Corinthians gathered, the wealthier Christians who no doubt provided most of the food for the love feast, they were taking a disproportionate share of it. That's what Paul calls eating their own supper. So here we've got this fellowship meal. You have the wealthy providing it, but then they're taking it for their class, their group. They're taking a disproportionate share of it, and the haves had more than enough, and you can see that is indicated by the excess of wine they consumed, and the haves, the have-nots, the haves had more than enough, and the have-nots were left hungry and were humiliated in the process, just like the thing you see in James. So here we're all gathering so here are all the people who brought the disproportionate share, the upper crust, the rich people. They're taking all this stuff, and you, we might give you, you know, I don't know, maybe we'll give you some of the broth. But we're going to have this, you see, and they're maintaining these class distinctions within the body of Christ. They're trying to stratify the church of Christ along economic class lines. 
And that's what Paul's talking about in 11 chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 to 34. He rebukes them for that behavior. And he tells them that by the wealthy discriminating against the poor in the fellowship meal, they were negating the very point of Christ's death. Now that's pretty powerful. He says they were negating the very point of Christ's death, which was to create a new people for his name. You see, a redeemed community in which these old distinctions of fallenness, such as social divisions based on class or wealth, in which those old distinctions of fallenness no longer held sway. God has created a new community that transcends this stratification. And you are maintaining it by stiffing your poor brothers and sisters at this fellowship meal. And he says you shouldn't do that. Because you're defeating or ignoring the very purpose of Christ. And when I think of the weak and vulnerable in our society, you cannot help but think of unborn children. Now when we are called as a people to defend those who cannot speak, weak, vulnerable, powerless, no voice, I just don't understand how we can sit here and think, oh, yeah, well, that's just, you know, we can't mess with that, that's politics. I'm pulling what little hair I have out. Right? I mean, aren't they poor and vulnerable people? And we need to be about speaking on their behalf, defending their cause unapologetically. Because I'm, God stands with the poor and the vulnerable and the weak and the needy and the powerless. And there is no more powerless person. That's a footnote. Okay. All right. Now, our turning from God, another thing I see from this, when I, I look and I say, well, what is God saying to us through what Amos said to the Israelites? And one of the things I see in this text that we've looked at is that our turning from God is all the more outrageous in light of how he has blessed us. He tells them, he says, listen, did I not deliver you from slavery and bring you into the promised land? Did I not provide for you spiritual blessings in the forms of the Nazarites and the prophets? Then he says, see, so you're turning from me, you're rejecting of me is horrible, all the more so in light of how I have blessed you. Well, when I think of how has God blessed us? You see, how has he blessed us? You see, I mean, he has defeated an enemy greater than the Amorites. Satan, death. He's defeated an enemy greater than the Amorites. He's transferred us into a realm into a kingdom that has just tremendous, glorious fruit, both now, you see, in the inaugurated kingdom, this glorious fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all of the blessings that we have here, and at the consummation, where we have this perfect life, eternal life, in that reality of no suffering, harm, pain, so he's done something here, he's given to us, and he's provided us prophets, so to speak. What? Through the scriptures. Do we not have a prophetic voice speaking the spirit of God? What are we listening to right now? You see, we have God, God provided that for us. And so I look, I say, if he, if he points these things out in saying to Israel... Your rejection of me is all the more culpable in light of how I've blessed you. If we turn from him, what would he say? If I could say that to Israel, what do you think I will say to you? If you, having been blessed beyond measure, treat my blessings as something that's trash. How will he do that, you see? Well, here's a clue. Hebrews 10, he says, if, for if we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of the, of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think the one who's trampled on the Son of God and considered a common thing, the blood of the covenant, by which he was sanctified and insulted the spirit of grace will deserve. After I've given and blessed beyond measure, you turn around and say to me, I don't care. 
He says, what do you think will be in store? He says, for we know the one who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You see, it is indeed. As I say all the time, ad nauseum. You know, that, that comic from the New Yorker, prepare to meet thy God with his dude just, just very dapper doing his tie as though it's just kind of going in for a job interview. Not going to be like that. And if you see anything about the people to whom God appears in the form of angels or anything, you don't see them styling in front of God. They're not styling. They're afraid to move because he's that glorious and that powerful. There's not going to be any of that stuff, none of this you know, bravado and all that junk. Uh, it's going to be something, he says here, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God, and it is indeed. Chapter 3, oh, got to make another point here. All right, those who divide, this is something else I see that I, I wanted to talk about. Those who despise God, you see, those who despise or ignore God, what do they do? They seek to compromise Christians and to suppress his word. You see, I mean, as he's talking about he, what he said of the Israelites. He says, you said of the Nazarites, you made them drink wine, and you said of the prophets, don't prophesy. Shut up, be silent, you see. They do that. Now, that's obvious in the case of non-Christians. I have this text up here, 1 Peter 4, 3 and 4. We know that in the case of non-Christians, right? Peter says, for enough time has passed to have participated in the desire of the Gentiles, having traveled in licentiousness, lust, instances of drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and detestable acts of idolatry, regarding which... They're surprised by your not running with them into the same flood of debauchery, vilifying you. Well, this is the world, right? I mean, the world, you sit there and say, I'm not going to do that. Well, yeah, let's go party, party, which all just means let's go and get drunk, stoned, tooting, uh, you know, whatever the, whatever the drug of choice is. Let's go do that, and then let's sit here and, and, and have sex. You know, that's just how it is. That's the code word. That's what it's about. That's the, the definition of partying, right? And you say, I'm not going to do any of that. Well, then what do you think the reaction is of, of your peeps? Do you think it's like, well, that's cool. I really respect that. No, it's like, what are you? <laughs> well, it's nothing different. See, we think we're the coolest thing ever. They, well, I, you know, in my generation, we really know. Those old uh, hicks back in the day, what do they know? They understood this thing about people vilifying you, and that's how the world does. The world tries to silence you, tries to pull you off your game. You see this in Acts. Of course, Acts 5, 27, 28 says, and, and when they had brought them, they set them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name, yet here you fill Jerusalem with our teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. What's the world's interest? The world's interest is having the word of God silenced. It does not want that word going out into the darkness. It is afraid of it, doesn't want it, and it has tricks to get you to shut up. And part of those tricks are, well, you're just not cool. Oh, 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 oh please, don't, oh, don't, don't tell me I'm not cool. You see, that, that'll just kill me. I mean, well, if you're going to play that card, then I have to be quiet forever. You see? I mean, this idea, you're not cool, you're whatever it is, and then they have other things, well, oh, you, you, you think you're so great, you know, you're uh, whatever it is, you're uh, self-righteous, you're, they got all kinds of tools, and the idea is simply they don't want you to lovingly calmly proclaim the truth of God into this world. Okay, so you wind up seeing that. But even in the church, you see, even among Christians, there's some of this stuff about, you know, not getting carried away with one's faith. You see, keeping things socially acceptable. Among Christians, there's sometimes suppression of bold preaching out of fear that it's going to upset some of the members. I mean, that's something, you know, that's, that's something to... Uh, well, you know, look, we, people just don't like that. They want to hear about that kind of stuff. And it upsets them. The key is to preach the Word of God. You see, the Word of God has to be preached. And I don't doubt that some people, I don't always like what I hear from it. Right? Who said that's the test of it? Well, if you have to, no, it, it has to be this calm and soothing. Sometimes it's a sledgehammer. Sometimes it breaks in and cuts you to pieces, and I don't doubt you don't like it. But it's the Word of God, and it's for your blessing. 
You see, and so we sometimes have that, and we sometimes uh, seek to suppress bold preaching out of fear that it would offend the sensibilities of our culture, and therefore it would make us less palatable to the culture. Well, we got, no, you don't want to say that kind of stuff because in our culture, we have men marrying men, and if you say homosexual conduct is sinful, oh, well, if the people will never think that's too small-minded. Is that how the church is to be? <laughs> huh? It's not. You see, the church is to proclaim the truth, and if, the, if that offends people, it will offend them. It will offend them, but we have to teach the truth of God. Have to do it. And if people walk, they leave, whatever it is. But I'll tell you what, the body of Christ will be strengthened, and I got news for you. I think you'll find that people who hunger for something to believe in and for the truth will be drawn. You see? But either way... We have to teach it. We have to. We have no choice. All right. Uh, we just have a couple minutes, but I want to look at 3, 1, and 2. He says, hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, <laughs> now catch that, therefore, <laughs> you only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Ooh. <laughs> Israel's special relationship with God, you see, well, that didn't operate, you see, to excuse their sin. It didn't do that. You see, it made their sin more culpable. To be God's elect is a position of responsibility. It's a responsibility. They should have been the last nation on the earth to reject the Holy One. Why? Because they were the people he had brought up out of Egypt, carried in here, defeated the Amorite, blessed them with these people, taken care of them, entered into covenant with them. They're the last people. So it makes their rejection of him all the more culpable. It's not something, you know, you just wind up saying, well, okay, uh, we're cool. You know, we're cool. Uh, so then it's, uh, you know, I get to be God. As long as we're cool. It's not that way. You see, it's not that way. The church's intimate relationship with God must never be used to excuse or justify sin. You see, by God's grace, we have a special relationship with him. We've been chosen by him in Christ to be his children. And our response to that needs to be one of obedience and holy living, not one of indifference and rebellion. Absolutely not. We are to be people who live holy lives. Matthew 5, 14, 16. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And you see in 1 Peter 1, 14 and 16, as obedient children... Do not conform to the former passions when in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, you also be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. It is a position of responsibility. It calls us to live holy, upright, godly lives because we love the One who has so blessed us. I heard that bell. Thank you.